Hello everybody, my name is Derek and yesterday I was looking through my old college uh, book, the economics class that I was taking, working with economics, the Canadian framework. This is the class that I took in 1995. Only took economics once and I didn't even do that great in it. Probably got something like 60 something percent which was among the worst uh, classes that I did as far as uh, results were concerned. And I didn't really remember too much from that, from that class. Supply and demand curve, that was the one thing that I remembered, but I didn't remember too much other than struggling through the course. And maybe that's why it took me so long to figure out how the whole money system worked. It's now been a couple of years now since the understanding of fiat money and how the whole system has worked, but the information is all has always been here for me. In fact, that's what I did last night was check to see if information for the dollar collapse was printed in a 1995 textbook. And there was four different pages that I definitely have to uh, talk a little bit about. The first one was the creation of money. This is what they said. Since charter bank deposits are considered to be money, it is actually possible for the charter banking systems to create money. The banking system can create deposits through loans and thus create money. Reading the rest of it, it's uh, still a little confusing for me now. It definitely would have been confusing for me back then. But it does all stem through the uh, interest that I have been talking about on here. This bank charges you $70, now we're talking this bank charges $1,000, 100000 here in interest. Money comes from nowhere and gets put into debt. That's what you're not going to uh, see in this book is the talking of the debt that you get from uh, such shows like Zeitgeist and Money as Debt. But if you read between the lines, then it, it was actually pretty easy to figure out. So I'm kind of like somewhat upset that it took me this long to figure out. But nonetheless, what can you do? Next thing I searched for was fiat money. And what I got on here was this. Our paper money circulates because of people's faith in it. There is no gold backing up our paper money. The term used to describe our paper currency is fiat money. It is money because it has been declared to be money and it is accepted as such." End quote. Wow. Because our faith is put into the money, that's why we have it. And I see people losing faith every day. There is no gold backing our paper money and I was wondering that a few years ago. Does our money have anything backing it? The answer was always available to me. And of course the answer is no, there isn't. But it says in here something very, very amazing. This is what I read. If a commodity is to circulate as money, as paper currency does, it must have certain characteristics. It must be durable. If money is to change hands often during exchanges, it must be sturdy. Well, here's the deal. When I accidentally leave money in my pocket and it can successfully go through the washer and the dryer, then it's durable. So that would pass the test. Next test, portable. Well, that's a no brainer. It passes the test. Divisible, since every product has the same price, money must be divisible into smaller amounts. It was difficult for me when I was younger, when I went to the States, to distinguish between the one and the 20 and the $10 bill because they didn't have different colors, but the number was there. So this, this is true, it is very divisible. Recognizable and readily acceptable. If, the, if it is not accepted by the population, the item will cease to function as money. Okay, I think it's recognizable not easily copied. The case of manufacturing counterfeit money would destroy the value of the commodity as money. That one doesn't pass the test. And they, they did say counterfeit money. I'll give you that. So if you want to use those terms, maybe it would pass. 
But the thing is, the ease of manufacturing money. See, it's not that easy to go out and mine gold and mine silver to produce energy that actually can be sustainable. It's not easy. It takes a lot of hard work. But how much work does it take to type in some numbers, type in some serial codes, some PIN numbers, some passwords, and thus create money? There is a reason why it's fraudulent. Face value greater than actual value. If the metallic value of a coin is greater than the face value of the coin, it will not circulate as money. For example, pre-1967 Canadian silver dollars do not circulate as money since the value of the silver in the coin exceeds one dollar. The same rule applies to paper currency. Well, that's why I guess we went off of those uh, metal standards of silver back in the 1960s here in Canada, 1967 and 1968. They even said on here that people will seem to hoard them when they become worth more than what they are, as they should. Because if you would have uh, been storing these quarters, dimes, half dollars and dollars back in the early 70s and 60s, your investment return was spectacular. Moving on now to page 207. Definition of money in Canada. The most recognizable form of money in Canada is paper currency, which is issued by the Bank of Canada. These paper notes are referred to as legal tender and must be accepted as a medium of exchange and for the payment of debts. In italics it reads, there is no gold or precious metals behind the issuing of paper money and italics. End quote. So this gave us the clue that there's nothing backing it. And I was even asking that question a few years ago. Well, what makes our money so good? Is it backed by something? Like, the answers were here the whole time. And finally, I'm going to finish this off with inflation, but pr particularly hyperinflation. How does hyperinflation occur? The main ingredient in all cases is the printing of too much money by the country's central bank. If the amount of goods and services available to be purchased does not increase the same proportion as the increases in the money supply, then prices will increase. More and more supply is made available to buy the same amount of goods. The faster the money supply is increased, the faster prices rise. And they had a few questions, and I would have just so loved to answer them back then with what I knew today. In times of hyperinflation, would an individual want to hold his or her wealth in cash? Well, what have I been saying? No, no, no. What would happen to purchasing power of pension, income, or savings during a period of rapidly rising prices? Lower wealth, of course. If you have $1,000 and the average product you purchase costs you $3 and it goes up to $450 and you still have that $1,000, you have less buying power. Could hyperinflation lead to social unrest in the country and why? Well, you know what? We'll see now, won't we? We will see. Will the present Canadian dollar be worthless someday? If that happens, what will Canadians use for money? Well, that's why we've been talking about gold and silver now, why well, haven't we? In times of hyperinflation, who was forced to sacrifice more? The borrower, of, the borrower of money or the lender of money? And I'll let you guys answer that one if you want. But I just look back and say, man, the information has always been there for us. But we're now at the point where more and more people are figuring this stuff out. And it all goes down to the faith of the dollar. And if more people are having difficult times and money is an issue for them, how are they going to have faith in it? So now, 
It's up to you to decide if you feel that all of the fiscal policies, all the monetary policies that have been done are actually going to help. You have heard so much on the mainstream media by now of that of an economic recovery because of the stimulus money, which is that of printed money. Jobs are being created right now, so it's up to you to decide. If you feel that the economy is recovering, then do the noble thing and start buying stuff that you do not need with money you do not have. Thank you for watching. Peace and light. Bye-bye now.